in the weeks before the Daytona 500, Earnhardt elected not to attend the annual fan and media preview event, drawing vocal criticism from fellow driver Jimmy Spencer. On February 3rd and 4th, 2001, the first time in his career, Earnhardt participated in the Rolex 24 Endurance Race at Daytona, the event which kicks off speed wheats at the track. Earnhardt and his teammates, Dale Earnhardt Jr., Andy Pilgrim, and Kelly Collins, finished fourth overall and second in class. Ultimately, however, 2001 Speed Weeks would be the first in many years that Earnhardt failed to win one race. In the Budweiser shootout, Earnhardt finished second to Tony Stewart. Earnhardt was also denied victory in the Gatter A Twin 125 qualifying race. Earnhardt had won every Twin 125 event he competed in during the 1990s and was poised to win again in 2001 when Sterling Marlin pulled off a slingshot pass going down the back stretch, taking the victory away from Earnhardt. The morning of the race, Earnhardt appeared confident and relaxed. Earnhardt was a frontrunner throughout the race, leading 17 laps. In the first three quarters of the race there were only two caution flags, the first one on lap 49 when Jeff Purvis hit the wall exiting turn 4 and the other on lap 157 when rookie Kurt Busch hit the front stretch wall while trying to pass Jonah Mechek and slid through the infield end onto pit road. On lap 173. Earnhardt drove his familiar black number no. 3 car in third place, with two of his team's cars, the blue number no. 15 Chevrolet driven by Michael Waltrip and the red number no. 8 Chevrolet driven by his son Dale Earnhardt, Jr., running first and second in front of him. On that lap, a huge crash on the back straightaway eliminated 18 cars in such a spectacular fashion, and led to the race being red flagged for a lengthy cleanup. Those involved in the crash were Jason Leffler. Steve Park, another of Earnhardt's drivers, Rusty, who would rally back to finish third, and Kenny Wallace, Jeff and Robbie Gordon, Bobby, the defending cup champion, and Terry Labonte, Mark Martin, Tony Stewart, Elliot Sadler, Jeff and Ward Burton, who had led the most laps in the race so far with 53, Jerry Nadeau, John Andretti, Buckshot Jones, Dale Jarrett, the defending Daytona 500 winner, and Andy Houston. The crash began when R. Gordon turned W. Burton at the exit of Turn 2. Stewart got hit by W. Burton, turned backwards against the outside wall, and was pushed airborne over R. Gordon. Stewart then flipped over twice, hooking to Bill Abante's hood, and stood on his front wheels before coasting to a stop in the infield, while W. Burton's car turned sideways and collected most of the field behind him. Earnhardt, Ron Hornaday, Jr. Ricky Rudd and Ken Schrader were four of the few drivers who escaped the crash scene. During the ensuing caution, Earnhardt spoke his last known words, in this conversation between him and his Rolex 24 teammate Andy Pilgrim, Earnhardt. So, you got any advice for me here coming up? Pilgrim. No, man, I haven't got any advice for you. Just keep doing what you were doing. Earnhardt. Okay, just wondering. Pilgrim. Cheers, talk to you later. The race restarted on lap 180, with Waltrip and Dale Earnhardt, Jr. Still out in front. Sterling Marlin, who had beaten Earnhardt in the Gatter A duel, led the next three laps before Waltrip took the lead again. The lead changed several times between Waltrip and Earnhardt, Jr. During the next few laps, as the laps wound down, Waltrip and Earnhardt, Jr., were running in first and second place with Earnhardt Sr. behind them, blocking Marlin's attempts to pass. With less than two laps remaining, Fox commentator Darrell Waltrip noted that Sterling had beat the front end off of that old Dodge, Marlin's car, just trying to get around Dale Sr. As the cars entered turn three on the final lap, Earnhardt still held third and was running in the middle lane of traffic. Marlin's number no. 40 Dodge was just behind him and running the bottom lane, while R. Wallace's navy blue number no. 2 Ford was directly behind Earnhardt and Ken Schrader was above Earnhardt riding the high lane in his yellow number no. 36 Pontiac. The accident occurred in turn 4, when Earnhardt made light contact with Marlin. Earnhardt veered off the racetrack onto the flat apron and went back on it only for Schrader to run into the passenger side of Earnhardt's car. 
Earnhardt rammed the retaining wall nose first at a critical angle, causing maximum damage at an estimated speed of 155 to 160 miles per hour. Upon impact, Earnhardt's right rear wheel assembly broke off, the passenger door window blew out and the hood pin severed, causing the hood to open and slam up against the windshield numerous times. Schrader pushed Earnhardt down the racetrack. No other drivers hit Earnhardt or Schrader after Earnhardt hit the wall, as they were able to make it past them without incident. As Michael Waltrip and Dale Earnhardt, Jr. raced to the checkered flag, Earnhardt and Schrader's wrecked cars slid into the infield grass near the exit of Turn 4. After coming to rest in the infield, Schrader escaped with minor injuries and went to check on Earnhardt, but called for paramedics. Race officials threw the checkered flag after the crash. Waltrip won the race with Earnhardt, Jr., finishing second behind him. Rusty Wallace finished third, Ricky Rudd finished fourth, Paul Cedar Bill Elliott finished fifth, Wallace's brother Mike finished sixth, Marlon finished seventh, Bobby Hamilton finished eighth, Jeremy Mayfield finished ninth, and outside Paul Cedar Stacy Compton finished tenth. Jonah Mechek finished eleventh. Earnhardt and Schrader were credited finishing 12th and 13th despite not completing the last lap, only 11 cars Waltrip and Earnhardt Jr. included finished on the lead lap as a result of the long green flag runs and the lap 173 crash. Afterwards, Earnhardt Jr. rushed to his father's situation. Earnhardt was extricated from his car by Daytona's safety teams and was taken to the Halifax Medical Center. Earnhardt's death was officially pronounced at 5.16 p.m. The official cause of Earnhardt's death was given by the Volusia County Medical Examiner's Office as blunt force trauma to his head among other injuries due to the incident. His head also suffered a bacillar skull fracture on impact, which caused the fatal injury. As per NASCAR rules, any driver who is involved in a crash and is unable to drive back to the pits or who must be extricated from his car, must report to the infield hospital. However, in severe cases, the driver may be sent directly to the emergency trauma room at the major hospital near the circuit. Less than two hours after the accident, NASCAR President Mike Helton announced Earnhardt's death. Earnhardt's car experienced a crash impulse of approximately 80 milliseconds in duration. The result of the wall impact and the impact from Schrader's car combined to yield a change in velocity of approximately Earnhardt's death triggered widespread media attention. One newspaper called the day, Black Sunday. Devastated fans congregated at the headquarters of Richard Childress Racing and Dale Earnhardt, in the night of the crash and at Daytona International Speedway. Earnhardt was featured in the following week's Time magazine, and a video from the race was played on nearly every major television channel in the United States. Earnhardt's funeral was held on February 22, 2001 at the Calvary Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. His death led both to a police investigation and a NASCAR-sanctioned investigation. In a reversal of previous NASCAR policy, nearly every detail of the investigation was made public. Days after the crash, Sterling Marlin received Hyatt mail and death threats from fans who blamed Marlin for Earnhardt's death. Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Michael Waltrip absolved Marlin of responsibility and asked everyone who loved his father to stop assigning blame for his death. On February 20, Marlin announced to the world about his responsibility. In the week following the accident, Bill Simpson, whose company Simpson Performance Products made the seatbelt Earnhardt was wearing during the race, also reported that he had also received death threats from angry fans. When asked about this, Darrell Waltrip stated that, NASCAR is an emotion sport and that all the fans love their drivers, so when something like this, the crash, happens, the connection to these racers makes you want to blame somebody and that somebody had to be involved and unfortunately, the blame was placed in the wrong place here. At a news conference five days after the crash, NASCAR officials announced that the left lap belt on Earnhardt's seat belt harness had broken. Dr. Steve Bahanon, NASCAR's medical expert, said he thought the faulty belt had allowed Earnhardt's trim to strike the steering wheel, causing the fatal bacillar skull fracture. This led to speculation that Earnhardt would have survived if his seat belt did not break. 
the first paramedics to respond to the crash scene maintained that the seat belts had been loose, but the lap belt was not broken or cut when the belts were unbuckled to cut Earnhardt from the car. However, NASCAR's investigation concluded that each of the imps who attended to Earnhardt after the crash reported that the buckle position of Earnhardt's harness was off-center by 4 to 8 inches, which would have been impossible had the lap belt not broken. A subsequent medical investigation revealed that belt failure did not play a significant role in Earnhardt's death. After a short court battle, it was mutually agreed to appoint Dr. Barry Myers, an expert on crash injuries at Duke University, to independently study Earnhardt's death. On April 10, 2001, Myers published his report rejecting NASCAR's explanation finding that Earnhardt's death was the result of his inadequately restrained head and neck snapping forward, independent of the broken seat belt, rendering the question of improper installation moot. On February 19, 2001, the Volusia County Medical Examiner performed Earnhardt's autopsy. The unusual act of notifying NASCAR and Teresa Earnhardt was made prior to releasing the records sought by members of the public and media. Three days later, Teresa Earnhardt filed a legal brief in the Circuit Court of the Seventh Judicial Circuit, in Infravolusia County, Florida once the complaint was filed. The coroner's office was barred from releasing the public records, including autopsy photographs, pertaining to Earnhardt, until a formal hearing on the merits of Teresa Earnhardt's case could be heard. On February 28, March 13, and March 16, 2001, the Orlando Sentinel, Michael Ruby, founder of website Essity.com, and Campus Communications, Inc., publisher of the University of Florida's student newspaper The Independent Florida Alligator, filed motions to intervene into the Earnhardt v. Volusia litigation in order to uphold their rights to inspect and copy public records held by the Volusia County Medical Examiner to include the photographs and videotape of Dale Earnhardt's autopsy examination. On June 12 and 13, 2001, a trial was then conducted before Judge Joseph Will. Will eventually ruled against Uribe and Che's original public records requests and constitutional arguments to inspect and copy the medical examiner files pertaining to Dale Earnhardt, to include autopsy photographs. Judge Will's ruling set forth in motion an extensive legal battle later fought in the appellate courts by both Uribe and Chi seeking to deem the denial of their public records request unconstitutional under Florida state and federal laws. Then on December 1, 2003, the United States Supreme Court declined to hear Uribe and CCI appeal. Thus, the Florida Legislature's March 29, 2001 law preventing release of Earnhardt's public record autopsy photographs would remain in effect. The Florida Legislature's March 29, 2001 law, also known as the Earnhardt Family Protection Act, was sponsored by Senator Jim King, R. Jacksonville, and changed Florida's previously long-standing and historically open public records laws from that day onward. The Earnhardt law deemed Florida's medical examination autopsy photographs, video and audio recordings exempt from public inspection without the expressed permission from applicable next-of-kin.